Hi everyone and welcome to our Thursday week three 3P three seminar session, which is made possible between the Cure Parkinson's Trust, World Parkinson's Coalition and the Van Andel Institute. I'm Makala Johnson, a postdoc in Patrick Bronner's lab at the Van Andel Institute, and I'll be chairing today's session. Our first speaker is Sarah Says A Tinza, sorry for the pronunciation, <laughs> who is a postdoc at the NIH. She'll be presenting on the genetic analysis of ALS, contributing pathways and cell types. After Sarah's presentation, we'll have the Q&A session. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to submit any questions you have throughout the session and we'll get to that at the end. Okay, over to you, Sarah. Okay, I think now. Okay, hello everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the work that I was working on for the last year. Um, by the way, my name is Sara. I'm a postdoctoral Dr. Fellow in the Laboratory of Neurogenetics at the LNG at NIH. Um, so I'm going to work about the work that I was working uh, during the last year. And the aim of this project was to use genetic data to identify uh, biological pathways and also cell types that can be involved in the pathogenesis of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And Actually, um, the strategy that I use here, so I use amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, but this kind of strategy can be used for other neurodegenerative diseases because even if they have um, different uh, genetic architectures, all of them share um, common genetic features. So all of these um, diseases are called complex uh, diseases because there are a combination of factors like environmental factor, genetic factors, and social factor that all together can modify the risk of having this disease. When we talk about genetic factors, it means like some forms of the disease will have monogenic, um, they will be monogenic forms, which means one gene is able to cause the disease, and this happens in familiar cases. However, in uh, other cases will be uh, polygenic, which means it's a combination of different variants uh, what will modify the risk of having the disease. And this happens mostly in sporadic cases. So the way that we have to approach these sporadic cases is by genome-wide association studies. The problem with this um, approach, even if it's a very robust and really widely used technique that has uncovered a lot of different genes in different diseases, but the problem is that not all the genetic variants are covered by GWA. So variants that are not common are going to be excluded and also in order for a variant to be significant in GWAS it needs to have a moderate to high effect so very very um, small effect variant won't have any won't be captured by GWAS and if you go here and if you see my mouse here so this is the p-value threshold for GWAS so what happened with all the variants that are below this super stringent p-value threshold. Are they important for the disease? Yes, probably they are, but they, we cannot nominate them by GWAS because they are not significant. Um, so basically what this means is like we only see the tip of the iceberg when we use GWAS. And in the case of ALS, this means like we identify these genetic risk loci associated with the disease in the last uh, previous in the last um, GWAS what, that was published in 2018. However, beneath the surface, there will be a lot of a small effect variants. And another limitation, and this is not a limitation of the GWAS, it's just a limitation of genetics and how we can uh, understand the biology underlying these genetics, is uh, that when we have monogenic forms of the disease, we can always uh, study how these particular variation or mutation affect the normal function of the gene. And we can track down into cell and, and animal models. However, when we have polygenic forms of the disease, it's highly challenging how to study the biology underlying these causes because there will be different genes with and different variants in different genes, and they will have different implications for the cell biology. So it's highly challenging. 
So because of that, to overcome this difficulty, so we propose a different method to study the biology underlying um, this sporadic disease. So we use polygenic risk score and we combine this with information that we have from um, bio predefined biological pathways. So polygenic risk score is a quantitative measure that we can use to calculate the summative effect of very small effect variant. This means when we have a very small effect variant, it won't have any, any effect on the rest of the disease. However, when we combine several of them together, we can able to measure this risk and maybe they are associated with the disease. And now imagine like here, instead of using this kind of representation, we put together variants that belong to genes that belong to particular biological pathways like mitochondrial biogenesis, autophagy. So if we are able to do that, we could predict the ALS risk of any biological pathway. And actually this is what we did. So where did we get information from the pathways? So for this kind of analysis, I got information from Molecular Signature Database, uh, which is a web collection that contains information from several sources of pathways. So I use information from canonical pathways, Hallmark gene set, and also gene ontology gene set. So in total, I analyze more than 7,000 pathways and I calculate the polygenic risk score for any of them. So for this kind of analysis, I have to use these three stage study design in which I use a reference data set, which is a previous summary statistic, GWAS summary statistic that was published in 2016. And it contained like 12,000 cases. So we use this reference data set to get information from the risk alleles and the weight that they will have on the disease. And when we have this information, we can go to our individual level data. So these are data that were genotyped in our lab. And uh, what we did is split the whole cohort into a training data set that contained the 70% of the cases and the replication data set that contained like the 30% of the cases. So our training um, contain 5,600 cases and we use information from reference data set to build polygenic risk score in our training and all the pathways that were significant were validated in the replication data set that contained 2,400 cases. For uh, identifying cell types related with the disease, we use a very similar approach, but in this case, we use the variance explained by polygenic risk score which is somehow like the reachability that can be um, of the disease that can be explained by this combination of variants. And in this case, we use data from single cell uh, cells in the brain. And also we put together our training and replication data set. Okay, what we find with this kind of analysis. So even if I analyze more than 7,000 pathways, we only found a few of them to be significantly associated with disease. So we only found gene ontology terms that were associated with the disease in the three categories. So in the biological process, we found processes related with uh, neuron and cellular morphogenesis, um, projection and development. Because the idea of all this paper was to uh, get information in a more comprehensive way. And because gene ontology are very redundant terms, um, to avoid that, we use semantic similarity that uh, cluster together gene ontology terms that are very similar between them. So by doing this, we can put all the terms that are similar under the same general uh, biological process. So when we did that, we um, found like all of them can be defined as cell part morphogenesis. Also, we found significant go terms in the cellular component category. And what we found was nuclear ER membrane network, cytoskeleton, autophagosome, and cell projection. In the same way, we use semantic similarity, but in this case, gene ontology terms were different, so they remain individual. And finally, we also find significantly associated with the disease ribonucleotide binding and protein terminus binding in the molecular function category. And 
semantic similarity reveal that actually they are very different terms. So finally, uh, we group all them together and they can be classified in three main categories. Uh, cellular trafficking, cell and neuromorphogenesis, and RNA regulation. So our analysis identified these three main pathways that are associated with ALS, or saying in another words, what we can say is that these particular pathways will carry a higher burden of risk variant in ALS patient versus control. Then, because at the beginning, we start our analysis with 7,000 pathways, and we were able to narrow down these to three main pathways. So now we wanted to see if actually we could find particular genes in these pathways that could have functional implication in the disease. So we apply Mendelian randomization to explore a specific uh, pathway specific quantitative trait loci, like expression quantitative trait loci. And even if this is a very complicated um, methodology in a very simplistic way for what we did here is like we use the SNPs in the pathways that we found significant and we look for variants that have QTL associated like change the expression of the gene and measure if these changes in the expression of the genes are related with the outcome that is ALS risk. And this is an, sorry, this is an example. So this variant, and if you carry this allele, the G in the gene SAM1 means that you will have a higher expression of SAM1 and the higher expression of the gene is um, associated with a higher risk of the disease. By doing this, we were able to nominate different genes that have QTL in the disease. And what we found, and if you see here in this part of the graph, the pink ones are genes uh, increasing the expression of the genes, it relates with increase in the risk of the disease. However, if you see in this part of the graph, you will see like a decreased expression on the on the gene, it's related with a higher uh, risk on the disease, which means like these kind of genes and these particular variants could be protective in the disease. And I think this is a very interesting approach because when we talk about genetics and biology, in this case, it's like a very easy way to test in our cell model or our animal model if those genes actually modify the risk in the disease because we can easily uh, overexpress or knock down the expression of those genes in other ALS models and to see if actually they play a role in modifying the risk. And finally, we use this approach to identify cell types related with the disease. For doing this part, we need um, cell uh, information from single cell data. So we use public um, data that were available. And uh, what this data contained 24 brain cell types and five brain region. And what we have from this data is something called specificity of expression. And let me explain this. Uh, so each gene will be expressed across these 24 cell lines at a different level. But we can calculate how much specific this particular gene is for a particular cell type. So we can divide how the expression of a gene in a particular cell type among uh, the total expression of the gene across the 24 cell types. And by doing this, we will get the specificity of expression. This value rank from zero which means a particular gene is not expressed at all in the cell to one, which means like this cell type is highly expressed in this particular cell type, like it's very specific, probably it's not expressed in other cell types. I, by having these specificity values across these 24 cell types, we bind in into 10 decide. So the DCI1 will have like non-specific genes for a particular cell type and the DCI10 will have a specificity values very high, will contain the most specific genes for this particular cell type. So if a particular cell type is related with the disease, what we expect to see is non very specific genes in the lower deciles won't explain so much of the variance of the disease. However, 
as we get more and more specific genes, they will explain more of the variance of the disease. And we can apply linear regression model and to see if actually this is significantly true. And when we observe, when we analyze our data, is that interneurons, median spiny neurons, and pyramidal CA1 um, neurons were associated with the disease. Again, in other words, like these particular cell types carry a higher burden of genetic risk variance in ALS cases versus control. And this is for me quite interesting because we know like uh, glial cells have an important implication in neurodegenerative disease in general, but the fact that we only found neurons uh, suggests for me like these neurons can be more like the origin of the disease and alteration in mitro, um, glial cell can be more like a consequence. And finally, because of course we analyze all this data and in our paper we only report what is significant. However, there are many pathways that are subsignificant and all of them can explain a percentage of the irritability of the disease. So we made this database available for anyone to look at it. Um, so that's, that's all. So the, the information that I want you to to take with is polygenic risk score enables identification of pathways and cell types that are relevant for complex diseases. And we can do this with ALS or other kind of diseases. We are able to identify in this particular uh, ALS analysis, intracellular trafficking, neural morphogenesis, and RNA regulation. And also we were able to identify interneurons, pyramidal CA1, and median spiny neurons. And also all the codes are available, uh, but I have to say like our paper is about to, um, to be submitted to the journal after the reviewers comment. So they suggest something, we change something. So the web page and the codes are still, I need to update this based on the reviewers recommendation. And finally, so thank you so much for all the help. And I have to say, like I said at the beginning, you can do this analysis with other diseases. So Sarah Barandes uh, is performed the disease analysis. So we work in parallel and, and she, she did the same thing for Parkinson's disease with also very interesting thing. So that's all, any question? Hello. Hey, hey. Hi. Thank you, Sarah. Fantastic presentation. I think you're doing really well if you can make me understand genetics. So <laughs> great work. Um, just to start off with a more broad question, I guess, I'm not particularly familiar with ALS. Is using these polygenic risk scores or mutations in the genes that you're pulling out using this technique is that something that would be looked at for patients' families or how do you see this being useful in the clinical setting? Okay, I think this is a very good question. Um, what we use is um, cheap data. So mostly all of them will have a sporadic disease. And also I think this is important in the sense like if we are able to identify particular pathways that are important for the disease because then they carry a higher burden of genetic variance, it could help in general to understand better the disease, but also maybe like for drug uh, development because we need, we know like this among other pathways carry a higher, a higher burden of this risk variant. So maybe it makes more sense when we design like drugs to focus in this particular pathways instead of others. So I think this is something that, that is important, like one of the conclusion of this, of this work. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a question here from Neil. Are these risk assessments performed across ALS patients or stratified based on clinical subtypes, e.g. vulva versus spinal onset, et cetera? So this is a very good question. And actually I performed this across my whole cohort. I didn't split them in different subtypes because I wanted to have as much statistical power as I could have. 
but this is a really good idea and actually I'm working in this um, for a follow-up paper. So trying to stratify in different subtypes and, and to see if actually we can see difference in biological pathways depending on if you have like a vulvar onset or spinal onset or a particular age. Okay. Uh, I saw that you mentioned about uh, that this can be used to identify genes that can then be followed up using cell culture or animal models to see how mutations in these genes play a role in the disease development and things like that. Is that something that you're actively following up in your lab? So actually, uh, I work in the neurogenetics lab, but this is a very multidisciplinary Play. So we are different groups, Parkinson, ALS, Lewy body dementia, and there are people that do cell biology. I do genetics, but I used to do cell biology. So I think for this, and as I saw in the presentation, for me, the Mendelian randomization is a very nice strategy because we can modify the expression of those genes in cell or animal models in a easier way that if we have to introduce the particular mutation in different genes and actually it's an easier way to test if actually functional alteration of these genes could have related with the disease and yes i think people in the lab is working in 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 other aspect of als biology of um, als but i'm not working on that in particular okay uh, another question here from Rita. It seems that the linear regression model data show the same general trends for multiple neuron types beyond the MSNs and interneurons and pyramidal neurons. Do you think that this suggests that neurons in general are a cellular location of the pathology in ALS? So um, this is a very good question and I have the same question when I saw the results. So I use other public data performed from RNA axon seq that can do like um, RNA seq from nucleus, like the soma of the neuron at the axon, because I thought like maybe the genes are related, as I observed, also with the biological process, more with axon and dendrite morphogenesis. So I performed the SACE analysis to see if genes that are mainly uh, localized in the axon were at higher risk that genes localized uh, mainly in the soma. But actually I didn't find any, any difference. So my own thought about this is like cell, like neurons ha carry a higher burden of these risk variants. Um, also I see the next question and is combined with this question and is we didn't use motor neurons because the data that we have available were this and these uh, data were validated before. So I was really confident to use this single cell data set. But yes, this is a very strong weakness of my study. Like we didn't try um, these particular motor neurons. So that was just a question from Miguel asking about mm -hmm. cortical and median yeah. spiny neurons instead of the mm -hmm. median, uh, the motor neurons. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Miguel. Um, another question, is the gene expression data collected on aggregate or stratified, for example, based on circadian rhythms or other variables such as age? I think you touched on this before when you were talking about the stratification you've used. I mean, I think they, they ask about the specific single cell data set. And actually, I think they are not stratified. They use different data set from mouse and different kind of labs and different single cell run and the nice thing about this data set is that they analyze everything in an homogeneous way so it's you can um, actually calculate this specificity value because expression is homogenized across the 24 cell types excellent thank you